Okay, so now without further ado, I'm going to hand this screen over to Oli Riches, the chairman of Richem Indonesia, to open today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Asti, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it, it's uh, it's an honor to, to sort of represent you on, on this um, session. It, it's an exciting development for us, and uh, I spoke in the AGM a couple of weeks ago about our, our desire really to sort of strengthen our advocacy proposition for, for the Chamber, and it's an area the Chamber's done a lot of work in uh, over the years, but um, uh, I think one of the sort of key areas or objectives myself that the board and the executive officers have, have really sort of committed to is is really enhancing our proposition um we have a an advocacy committee that was was um advocacy committee which was launched last year which is led by pak dendi um from diageo uh, and also we've uh, recently and hopefully you'll have seen uh, announced a new partnership with um Kioran partners and, and pat knocker um who really focus and specialize in public affairs and, and strategic consulting. Um, uh, so they will work closely with the, the committee and the board itself to identify, represent, and, and hopefully gain real traction on some of the key issues on behalf of the members. Um, this partnership will also run, as today sh shows, um, plenary update sessions uh, for members to remain you know, informed and, and to be able to ask questions about specific issues um, and the wider business environment. We'll obviously run sessions where we, we deep dive into, into certain topics uh, as, as and when needed as well. So um, a quick thanks from me, from me to, to Pat Knocker, who, who you'll hear from shortly, but also to, to Pat Haroon, who, who's, um, who's moderating today's session. So uh, I hope it goes well and enjoy it. And uh, I hope it's as interactive as it possibly can be in, in this format. Um, Chris, I, I shall hand over to you to get proceedings moving. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ollie. Just to echo Ollie's welcome to everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here, and uh, it, it's great to see the uh, very diverse range of Britcham business interests on this call as well, from the larger multinationals to the uh, locally incorporated companies uh, and some of our very, very valued stakeholders in addition. Um, I'd just like to pick up on uh, a point that Asti uh, raised earlier at the opening. She did suggest that people could put their questions in the chat box. Really, we encourage you not to. Uh, we much prefer for you to raise your hands um, and uh, be visible uh, to the panel, to Pat Nock in particular, um, and share whatever thoughts you have on a, a rather more direct basis. Um, secondly, uh, again, Oli mentioned that um, Pat Harun, um, who uh, has recently been uh, appointed as one of the first members of the newly inaugurated um, consultative board of Britcham, having spent six years uh, as vice chairman and therefore timed out constitutionally from the board, um, taking over from Pat Donny today, who you will have seen in the promotional material. Pat Donny, unfortunately, is under the weather, but pleased to report um, is making good progress um, uh, as, as well. So th thank you for stepping in, Pat Harun, and Pat Harun will be uh, navigating the Q&A comments and uh, opinions from you later on. Um, with that, I think it's fair to say that Pat Knocker is, is well known to many of you. Uh, there was a, a link to his bio, so I won't reproduce that, Pat Knocker. Instead, allow all the time and all the bandwidth and all the focus on your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Well, I would like to thank, on behalf of current partners, the board of Britcham for this opportunity, and this is our first appearance today and I hope this will be one of many to come and that we will be uh, creating using a very much used word synergies to promote British Indonesia. So I would now return it to Richem. How do we proceed from here? Can I proceed directly or all right, so since we are talking about the public affairs, it's always good to start with the legislative. 
baskets where everything will be decided and you will have to base our business on. And of course, with see there are 73 participants that are representing various sectors. So we try to have a common platform where anybody or everybody can uh, participate in. The interesting aspect about the parliament is that this year, uh, the parliament has announced that 33 priority, priority bills will be passed into law this year. So far, we have just passed the uh, midterm of 2021, 12 are now currently in discussion, plenary discussions. And the track record of our parliament in this regard is not very good because since 2014, the maximum number of bills that have been passed into law never exceeded 20. So 20 was the maximum number. So 33 would, I would say, based on that uh, track record, probably not very easy to achieve, say probably. And uh, we will have a look at some of the interesting one on data protection was included in the discussions. The bill on new and renewable energy will be as well. And also the general provision on taxation. So these are three that I would say, that, well, maybe renewable and new, new and renewable energy will not touch everyone, but it's something that will be very closely related to the climate change issue, not just everyone anyway. So another thing that, uh, that is of concern to all of us is of course the COVID situation. And we have officially overtaken India as the epicenter of uh, the pandemic because last, the last number, official number, yesterday was 48,000. India has, I think, achieved 33,000. So we've beaten India in that. Not a very good record to beat, but that shows you how bad the situation is. And the Minister of Health has predicted that the peak will occur mid-July, which is right now. And epidemiologists are of a different opinion. They say that the peak will occur in August. But anyway, the virus doesn't listen to any of those. And I think we are now left to our own devices, unfortunately, those who are in Jakarta, because Everywhere you see, we are in red zones. So I would stop at this point and maybe hand over to Adi if you have some comments on that, Adi, or thank something you. else. <laughs> um, thank you, Panoka, and um, uh, hi, everybody. Um, I think uh, I'll pose some questions first to Panoka. And then uh, from that, we'll have um, some more interactions um, with all the other audience here. Uh, Panoka, you mentioned about uh, uh, how the COVID situation is currently. But uh, if you look back a little bit, um, um, what would you say about uh, uh, handling of this pandemic uh, from, the from your perspective of the Jokowi administrations. Um, uh, President Jokowi seems to uh, focus more on the economy rather than on the public health. And uh, what do you think has been um, his, his um, priorities in, in this uh, handling of the pandemic? 
Thank you, Eddie. I think uh, one thing is clear. The pandemic is something totally new. Nobody has experience in dealing with that because the last pandemic we had was more than a century ago and nobody has experience in that. Um, the government is dealing with this piecemeal level. So you're not getting ahead of the curve, which is also difficult. And one thing is also very clear. Indonesia being a developing economy cannot be locked down totally. Because the bigger number of workers are in the informal sector. And in the informal sector, you can say well, how stupid these people are that they go to work every day, but they have no choice. They don't go to work, they don't have anything to eat on that day. So for many of the workers in the informal sector, it's just a few matter of survival. Of course, the government has issued this uh, cash bantuan uh, social tunai, cash disbursement, but the amount is 300,000 per month, 300,000 rupiah, mind you, meaning about $20. And even the, uh, I would say, the poorest worker would need much more than that. So the government is in a dilemma how to deal with that. We cannot afford to spend more, I suppose. And on the other hand, these people have to, to eat. So last year, I had a similar discussion with many of my expatriate friends. They said, how, why are these people still doing it? I said, look, if they don't go to work, they don't eat. It's as simple as that. We are lucky. We are all, I would say, if I use this word, knowledge workers. We don't, we don't have to be physically present in any employment situation. We can do things from behind the computer, but we are a real minority, particularly, particularly in Indonesia. So I would say that the way the government is handling this leaves a lot to be desired. But on the other hand, a lot of things cannot be done differently either because you have to allow people and you cannot enforce lockdown very strictly because you cannot provide a living for them. So it's unfair to say to them, well, you're not allowed to go, but we, we won't provide you with any means to survive either. So that's the situation, that's the bitter that we are facing. So we are all left to our own devices to survive. And anecdotally, because that's all we have, the official figures are sometimes, uh, I would say they would raise questions too. But the situation today compared to last year, last year we can take a dispassionate view of the pandemic. No, oh, okay. People are dying, but we don't know that. But this time around, early this month, so many prominent Indonesians come to the pandemic. And I'm afraid we haven't seen the last yet. If the epidemiolo epidemiologists are right, we have yet to see the peak. And today is already scary enough. Uh, indeed. Um, that, that would um, bring us to the next um, so You already went, asked me about Jokowi prioritizing the economy, and I think that's something that would be interesting. If I allowed to comment on that first before you of course. ask me the, the next question, part. because it's very clear that to Jokowi priority is the economy. So everything is subordinated to economic uh, interests. I'm not uh, implying anything sinister about that, but 
he is single-mindedly focused on the economy. Everything else is secondary because he wants to leave a legacy. He, I think his signature uh, aspect until the, the pandemic hit was interest rate. And the number of infrastructure projects are really staggering. But I think one thing that differentiates Indonesia from, say, UK, oh, well, of course, there are a lot of differences, but if in the UK, and I would say in America to some extent, people say the government is the problem. We want to have as little of government as possible. Indonesia is the other way around. Indonesians like government. They respect government. And the government also wants to have more of that respect. And this, particularly in the Jokowi administration, I think this is getting clearer by the day that all economic endeavors must be coordinated by the president himself. I would put under this category also the, um, the way that Kadin is now put under the government influence by having the chairman of Kadin uh, being put in place with some pressure from the palace. And that is me, it's, I, I'm not meaning this in a sinister way, but he already has the um, SOEs under his control. And now with Kadin, I think he wants to have the private sector also under his control to achieve his development uh, agenda. That's how I see it. Thank you, Panoka. Um, moving forward to talk a little bit more about the economy since we're already in that uh, area. Um, uh, aside from the handling of the pandemic, one of the major um, focus of his administration, as you mentioned, was to um, have an economic legacy uh, in his second term. And of that, uh, ombudsman law seems to be the cornerstone of that um, priorities. Um, what do you think that could uh, strengthen his um, um, ideas and ambitions in uh, putting back, at least yeah, from, from this pandemic, putting back the economy on the track that he feels uh, would leave him with a good one, with a good legacy? Well, I think diffi it's difficult right now because uh, prior to the second wave, I think the government was still uh, optimistic that the growth of 4.5% this year overall will be achieved and that that's not going to happen. And the government debt is increasing. And uh, fortunately, I would say, fortunately, the plan to move the capital outside Jakarta is now being postponed indefinitely. I must say that I agree with the, with the long-term plan to have the capital moved out of Jakarta. But to do it within such a short time, I would say, is um, not possible would be cutting a lot of corners and you cannot build the new capital within one residential term. So Jokowi has focused solely on the economic development and anything that stands in the way will be uh, neutralized including the KPK, the Corruption Eradication uh, Commission. So I think it's clear from the beginning that he is not interested in strengthening the KPK, as you call it, in Indonesia, 
because that is an obstacle to achieving his economic objectives. Because at the time there were many government officials complaining that they're, they're afraid to spend their budgets because they will be uh, targets of KPK. Well, of course, if you do nothing wrong, and of course, there shouldn't be a reason, but that was, uh, I would say, two years ago, very much in the press every day that people are, are not spending, or government officials are not spending their budgets because of the factor. So the KPK must not be endowed with such superpowers. And that's why it's weak. So everything. This is a general statement. Everything will be subordinated to economic uh, development. Um, continue on on the economic um, uh, policy um, on a more um, uh, focused way. Um, most uh, most recently, that uh, President Jokowi inaugurated a new ministry, uh, Ministry of Investment, as uh, another arm of his administration that seems to focus more on the investment. So what do you think uh, of that uh, move, whether that uh, could improve uh, investment climate in Indonesia or that um, it's just a matter of, um, you know, um, a, a superficial uh, move towards uh, real investments that could uh, um, really been poured in into the country? Well, I think the situation like that under Suharto, under President Suharto, where the Minister for Investment, where there was a Minister for Investment, but the situation then is totally different. We didn't have regional autonomy, and now a lot of the uh, executive powers have been transferred to the provinces and to the uh, regencies. So I don't see how a minister for investment can actually regulate everything to the uh, provincial level. And there will be a lot of pushback. Some of them may be overt, but uh, I would say that a lot of the battles will sort of occur below the surface. So, you know. The way bureaucrats fight uh, the people who are trying to control them is by saying, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, but you do something differently. And I think we will be seeing a lot of that happening. And I think the, the basic ideas may be good and the reason or the, the uh, motive Audible. He wants to have everything coordinated, but the political structure today is fortunately, or unfortunately, some would argue it's unfortunate, but I would say that overall, you're better off now with the system of uh, government in the country. Um, okay. Um, uh Continuing on a little bit on, on a subject that uh, you know a lot and uh, since you've been in that uh, area for a long time. Um, one particular area that uh, seems to be of uh, attention of uh, President Jokowi and his administrations in terms of um, building his economic future is on the uh, new and renewable energy. Uh, there is this discussions about um, uh, the bill on, in the parliament, uh, talk about um, uh, uh, achieving certain target uh, in 2030, um, participating in COP26 uh, this year in Glasgow, uh, hosting the G20 next year. Uh, where do you think uh, his uh, emphasis or his... Uh, desire to be in terms of uh, having a real uh, foundation in building uh, energy, uh, um, new energy in Indonesia for the future? 
Well, I think the government is saying all the right things, but we still have to see some concrete results coming out of that. We have the bill now in Parliament, and people are talking about having that passed into law by the end of the year. I think there's a possibility of that happening. But at the same time, there are discussions about uh, presidential regulation. It is also to, to some extent, I think, overlapping with that bill, which is uh, in Parliament. And also, there's this 10 year electricity development plan in addition of RUPTL, which is from 2021 to 2030. We have heard a lot about that, but it's not happening yet, so nobody knows exactly what it contains. But all these issues will, of course, be intersecting with uh, the plans to, to achieve carbon reduction. The Minister of Finance has talked about the carbon tax, which has caused a lot of uproar. And I think it will be continuing to be like that until the end of the year. So I don't think that a lot will be achieved in that respect. But of course, we have to be ready for the uh, big meeting in Glasgow. How that will be achieved is still a question mark. All right. Um, yeah, we've touched on, on a wide ranging of issues um, from COVID to um, investments and then to uh, new energy. But I think um, for the time being, we'll uh, cap our discussions in, in trying to gather your thoughts on the, um, what is, what is the, the, the current situations in terms in in terms of um, uh, uh, having the, the president think about his uh, current political stability and his thinking of uh, moving forward and, and trying to establish his legacy as a, as a, uh, uh, in his second term as president. Well, I think his legacy is very much determined by the way he handles this pandemic, I would say. So I really hope that we can control the pandemic very soon, although right now we're in the midst of this increasing trend. But uh, I don't think that the president can leave this pandemic behind him without resolving much of the issues. And these issues will still continue at least until next year. We have the presidential elections in 2014. And as we know, one year before that, things will come to an end already. So in, in 2024. So 2023, nothing much will happen. Even now we already see people looking for power. So that's the way we see. We do things in Indonesia, so not much will be moving as of next year because everybody is already uh, getting prepared for presidential elections. And that will dominate discussions, I would say, by the end of this year already. All that right. will be a topic that all Indonesians will have a view about and will talk about it loudly within the, in the, environment, the immediate environment within the uh, next few years after the end of this year. Thank you, Panoko. That seems to be um, uh, the end of our first part of our discussions to, uh, today. And I hand it over to pa Harun to lead the further discussions among uh, members and all, all, the, all of the other audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Pa Noka. That's um, very insightful. Um, I think um, information about the bills, the 
uh, we, we still remember the plan to move capital. That's um, we know that uh, nothing much really happened, um, and and uh, yes, we can see the government is focusing very much on the on the economic de development while uh, we are still battling for the uh, uh, to to handle the COVID nineteen virus. So I think uh, now uh, I would open uh, a floor uh, for questions. And um, those who um, want to ask questions, please uh, raise your hands. I, can, I, can, I think I can see from here. And, uh, and, and, and please um, uh, uh, turn on your video if you can when, when asking the questions. Uh, state your name and, and, and your company. Uh, I see uh, Gregory, please. Thank you. And uh, hello, Anoka. It's really oh, good hi, to see Greg. you again. Good to see you. Uh, I haven't seen you for a while. Yes, since that time in the airport. <laughs> I think it's the last time we had a chance That's to meet correct. face That's to face. That's a few years ago. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to um, ask your thoughts on Indonesia's minimum capital requirement for FDI. Um, this is something that you know we're trying to get the government's attention on because the government seems to be reinforcing this even more aggressively now than in the past. For comparison, you know, Indonesia has a 10 billion rupiah minimum capital investment for yes. FDI, in excluding land and buildings. China has no minimum capital requirement. Uh, Vietnam, only $10,000 um, and Indonesia's uh, equivalent is around 700 to $800,000 is the minimum capital. And this, you know, this disproportionately impacts knowledge-based businesses, which if they invest here, have the potential of making Indonesia more competitive by providing knowledge-based inputs to manufacturing and all other sectors. So I'm wondering you know, what your view is on what the reasons are, and there may be more than one, uh, but what the motivations are between Indonesia's seeming allergy to having um, what Indonesia defines as SME scale investments. Um, and I think it's particularly important given that Indonesia has been negotiating so many um, economic partnership agreements, many foreign countries, uh, the, the bulk of the businesses in those countries are in small to medium scale. And you could have a lot more investment, a lot more job creation, but it's basically being discouraged in favor of much larger projects. So I really would be interested to see, uh, hear your thoughts on, on what the motivations are for this relatively high threshold. Motivation is simple. Get as much foreign capital as possible. And of course, that's counterproductive because people will think twice before spending that, that amount of money. And um, this is, in my view, short-sighted because if you're banking on getting a few um, investments, big ones, that are not going to happen, and you have uh, 100 smaller investments, that will be bringing more money. But I think this is driven by more of a, I would say maybe ignorance about the structure of the um, businesses in other countries. People look at uh, Amazon and previous times at General Electric, which is now not the big company anymore. And I think that is what the government is dreaming about. And forgetting that in many countries, it's the medium enterprises, medium and small enterprises, that are still large by comparison to Indonesian equivalents. Because what is a small and medium enterprise in Indonesia? And what is a small and medium enterprise in the United States? A small enterprise in the United States is still a large company by Indonesian standards and Canadian too, I think. But Canada has just, I think, uh, signed on to the 
comprehensive economic partnership agreement with Indonesia? Well, starting negotiations. So starting uh, negotiations. A few, few okay. years to go, but yes. So it will take 10 more years, I would say. <laughs> no, because when I was uh, quite involved with the Australian uh, Australian Indonesia, which eventually became the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, but the the uh, seeds were planted in the first SBY administration already mm -hmm. uh, by the meeting between Ari Pangestu and uh, Akfeo, and we had the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. I think twelve years after that. So that's why I'm saying you, you will need 10 more years, maybe. Yes, and you're so, probably right. <laughs> and Canada is quite a distance from Indonesia. So there will be not too many Canadians traveling to Indonesia, I would say. It's different from Australia, where it's just a few hours flight from any uh, capital city in Australia to Indonesia, which of course uh, helped a lot. And also, I would say being involved in the bilateral relationship has a lot more understanding on the Australian side toward the situation in Indonesia than in other countries, including Canada. Very true. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Good to see you. Likewise. Thank you, Pa Noka. So I think. Uh... Uh, next question is from uh, uh, Jens uh, Rich, uh, please. Hey, thank you very much, Pawan, and hello, Panoka Tamakasi. Nice to meet you again. Nice to meet I, you too. I I just have maybe I mean um, uh, two oh, yes, questions. Yes. Or, yeah, two Rachel, questions. Yes, yeah, good to see you. Good to see you again. Two two questions or just two observations. I mean, you you know the the public sphere very very well. Um, and I don't know, is it, I of course see more the insurance part or financial services part, at, but is it, is it fair to say that the relaxation or liberalization on the work permits general, I mean, employing say foreigners, even so for specialized position, it's still not really liberalizing or do you, is that only basically uh, disconnected to financial services? I think we, we still have challenges uh, to get expertise in certain areas where it is needed. And it's quite, I would still say, troublesome in, and uh, take a big effort uh, to get where you want to get, actually with a, a good purpose. But I just say maybe my first question around generally your observation on work permits and liberalization and managing, of course, the sensitivities to, to the country and the workforce without doubt. And these, the second question, I know that you are an expert on, of course, um, government and generally on advocacy and, uh, and of course, yeah, pu public uh, on, on, on how to do the, the public advocacy. Is it, is it fair to say over the years that somehow the, the parliament is taking a different position in public when it comes to opinion building? I mean, uh, I just say at the moment, in the past, it was more ministers, more um, government officials in TV shows, uh, in, 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 in the news. It's now, I think, many more parliamentarians who open the door also as an advocate to, to people. And uh, the media has partly shifted. I mean, that's maybe, again, uh, out of insurance, but just maybe these two questions to get your insight, yeah? Well, thank you. Well, I, I'm glad to say that you're not being singled out. The insurance industry is still difficult to get permits. So it's not particular to your industry unless you're from uh, a particular country in Asia. So everybody else, and this is not a new situation. This has been, I be, first time I became a business executive in 1974. That shows how old I am. But the situation was already like that. And at the time, I was working with a German company called Siemens. And even for highly qualified engineers at the time, it was difficult. So the situation has not changed. So, that, so that's what you call stability. Or it's in uh, now 50 years almost, or 50 years, almost 50 years, nothing much has changed. So it is still difficult for uh, qualified people 
from other countries to get a permit to work in Indonesia. But on the other hand, we see that it's very easy for some not very quite qualified workers from some from a particular country to enter Indonesia. But that's a different matter. But I would say if your concern was whether the financial services industry is being discriminated against, I can uh, tell you that it's not the case. It's difficult for everyone. So that's for the, about the work permits. About advocacy, I think it's in a way it's good that parliament members are also getting heard because um, we had a presidential system that was, um, I would say, towering above all the other institutions under the new order that ended in 98. And we don't want to return to that situation. Again, I would say most Indonesians, some of us are nostalgic about Pak Harto. Well, not everything he did was bad, but I don't want to return. Speaking about myself, I don't want to return to that situation. And, um, well, the parliament only really started functioning, I would say, early 2000s, but they're still learning. So they're still learning and they still want to be heard and it is good that they can be heard as long as they say uh, things that make sense. Sometimes, like many other politicians in other countries, they also talk nonsense. But if they say something that makes sense once in a while, I think we should be happy because there will be a control to the executive arm of the government, which is now exhibiting tendencies to be uh, also over um, acting like a superior body. And I think the parliament must be heard and it's good that we can still have this voice of parliament that is listened to by the people. So I'm not too worried about that. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you very Thank, thank you, Pa, pa Noka. Uh, next uh, question uh, will be from Ephraim Santos, uh, please. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Ephraim Santos here in Sumba Island, Whoa. in uh, NTT. Uh, I'm a bit interested on the, the bill of renewable energy because uh, uh, I'm running a training center, a TVET, a BLK, where uh, by chance it's all um, part of the G2G, the UK and the Indonesian government through the Mentari program is setting up a power station, a uh, solar photovoltaic in a village. And our yeah. training center was asked to, to train the, the people. And uh, being involved in this uh, renewable energy, um, uh, this bill has, is being seen by this uh, by the solar panel sector, uh, something very important because uh, <clears throat> if it is passed uh, in a very favorable way, uh, it would uh, it would help us uh, as Indonesia. It will help us uh, achieve uh, much of our targets for um, the sustainable development goals, uh, and also create the uh, great lots of jobs because of the. Of the of the how they call this the, the the attractiveness of setting up and attracting investors for the solar panels etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but the, uh, I, looking at the uh, the trend now uh, we 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 still have to see uh, the reaction of PLN because if we will have solar power what will happen to them we, we disturb the 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 system because of our yeah. we are only strong during the the daytime and at night we 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 Big, uh, we demand a big load from the generators of PLN. Aside from, uh, I'm sorry if this question is a bit sensitive, but uh, uh, a, a lot of emphasis is still being given to coal. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I hope I'm not asking a sensitive question because you come from the coal industry yourself. No, not anymore. That oh, was okay, a few good. decades ago. Okay, I was good. running a coal mining company, but now I'm... Uh, I'm also, I also support renewable energy. 
Okay, good. So the 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 question now is, uh, uh, how do we 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 need to satisfy them also because uh, there are also a lot of people involved in uh, a lot of uh, employed people in the coal industry and in the PLN. Yeah. And so, uh, how do we balance this? Uh, this this I think it's making the the parliament a bit uh, uh, having a headache how to formulate the the bill on this uh, on this regard. Do, do you have some uh, some inputs on this? Thank well, you. Thank you. Um, I think the coal lobby is very strong, but it's also clear that Indonesia cannot uh, follow the the um, the worldwide movement toward more. Um, uh, I would say greener technology, and a way must be found to phase out. Because you cannot say we close the coal mining companies right now. That will create a lot of more problems than it solves. But I would say a gradual phasing out would be desirable, and I don't think that's happening yet. But the bill on renewable, new and renewable energy is currently in parliament. And I think the signs are good that they, it will be passed by the end of the year. But another development that you should also uh, be aware of is this um, presidential regulation that is probably going to happen before the bill. So that may also provide some, some support. But that said, in Indonesia, if you perseverance, if you persevere enough, you can achieve that. I'm well. I must disclose that I'm uh, in my personal capacity. I'm also advisor to use Coca Cola Amatil. It's now Coca Cola Euro Partnership, Euro Pacific Partnership, and despite all the problems that I think you are familiar with, the company managed to have a solar, the largest solar panel in Southeast Asia installed, 7.5 uh, megawatts, which is quite a big uh, solar panel. And also I happen to know that other companies like Danone are doing the same, smaller, solar panels, but they, they have it without having the law passed. So I think if you talk to people and you contact them, you make it clear that it's necessary. It's a lot of work that you need to do, but you can get there even without the law having passed. So in Indonesia, many things are possible. And I'm not talking about unethical things, because my company is dealing with ethical business only. We are not dealing with companies that try to do things under the table, we are out of that. So things can be done. And if people say that in Indonesia, you can only get things done if you pay, that's not true. I established Kiran Partners 15 years ago, and we are still uh, surviving and still running now without resorting to that because we are a signatory to the United Nations Global Compact of 2008 on the second year of our operations because we did not want to be involved in that and we can still do business. Maybe we could do more, but we don't want that. We want only to do business that is. And it's still possible to do that in Indonesia, despite what everybody else is saying. So persevere, that's what I am saying. Mm -hmm. And talk to people, get support, try to build alliances, get the local people to support what you're doing, and then you can achieve things. Thank you, sir. By yourself, impossible, mm -hmm. that's impossible. But mm -hmm. you have to build alliances. You have to find 
other organizations, other like-minded uh, people, also in government, not everybody's against you. There are also possible uh, allies in government. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pa Noka. That's um, very positive and, and encouraging uh, for for all of us. Um, uh, the next uh, question will be from Ian Betts and Wilson Andrew. Uh, let's start with Ian. Uh, time is yours, Ian. Thank you very much, Pat. I'd like to say thanks to Chris Wren, to Britt Cham for arranging this session this afternoon, uh, and to Pat Noka. We've had a very wide ranging discussion. It's remarkable how much we've compressed into such a short time. We've talked about renewable energy, COVID-19, investment policy, governance and government with a small G. It's been immensely valuable overall. And all of this is associated with advocacy and pushing forward the uh, advantage for business, British business. It's the British Chamber after all. Uh, I've been associated with Indonesia since 1992, and it's clear that Pat Nolke is an expert in these matters, listening to him this afternoon, known him a long time. It's also clear that Britcham is a very effective vehicle for these kinds of interests uh, and policy issues. So my question is, how do we move forward from here uh, in terms of advocacy on the part of British business? Is it the role of this committee, and I understand it's the, only the first session, hopefully of many, uh, is it our role to find a way to contribute ideas, points uh, on these particular issues to Chris or to the committee that can be formulated into white papers on individual topics? Or what's the pathway to moving forward on this? And I'm open to responses from Chris or Patnoka or anyone else who feels able to contribute. Uh, I say this because I think we're all interested in looking at new ways and effective ways of capturing the, the points of crisis that we're seeing in this country today. It's a country that all of us are very uh, well invested in, either personally or through business. And these topics that we've discussed this afternoon are all crucial to our business and personal lives. So it's imperative that we get a grip on them uh, as soon as possible and have some influence on how governance and government play on them. So. That's my observation. I think it's been remarkably useful for a first session, but I'd like to know how we move forward and what can we do as participants to contribute to the effort? Chris, Pat Noka, Harun, well, thank you very much. I think uh, I'm not calling the shots in organizing this, so I would uh, defer to Chris and Oli to respond to you, Ian. Yeah, I'll, I'll set the I'll just quickly. follow what, what the gentleman will decide in the future. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, I'll step in quickly and then I'll pass this over to, to Chris. So it's, Ian, you're right. I mean, there's an awful lot of topics and uh, we've got to be careful. We don't try to take off, you know, take on too much and, and then not sort of deliver on any of it, which uh, is always a sort of danger in these situations that we dilute what we can do. So the, the purpose of the committee is, is to help filter that. Um, so yeah, we, we welcome any suggestions from, from the members and that's, that's, Primarily what this has been set up for is to represent the members um, without over-promising and, and under-delivering. So, um, yeah, the first step is, is to open that communication channel uh, and uh, I suppose gain the trust of the members to, to sort of come to us with their, their thoughts, suggestions uh, and areas of concern. The committee will, will then obviously sort of look at that and the committee is made up of, of board members led by, by Pak Dendi um, and advised by Pak Haroon as well in, in his capacity. Um, from there, then, then obviously the, the, the reason we've, we've partnered with, with Pat Nocker and his, his business is then to really look at the, the sort of the ones we can make an impact on where there's a genuine chance of moving the, you know, moving the needle slightly uh, and getting some traction. Um, and that's really then deferring to Pat Nocker and his, his expertise and, and connections and uh, advice on how best to do that. Uh, Chris and the team will then communicate back to the members in terms of where we're at. And, and as the chairman, my, my key thing is to, to hopefully find some, some areas where we can get some tangible um, movement. I won't say results because that's not the way things work, but um, certainly tangible movement in the right direction that uh, we can sort of advise and, and, and update on um, accordingly. Chris, happy to take, take some views from your side as well. But that's certainly my, my intention. Yeah, thanks, Ali, and uh, very practical. Um, 
uh, Ian, a, a great sum up. And uh, I, I'm very, very pleased that you provided the opportunity for us to give uh, perhaps just a little bit more color to this initiative and, and what's been going on uh, in the past. So I'm aware that you're only recently back in the country after, uh, uh, after having been in other parts of Southeast Asia. Um, for, first of all, um, there are different types of advocacy issues and uh, whether there are issues that ha are shared issues, as in shared with um, other invested companies from other nationalities, whether they're, you know, Japan, Australia, um, uh, America, Canada, and so on. Um, we, we have been working reasonably effectively, I would say, on an informal basis with uh, the, the foreign chambers of commerce, if you like. We have a grouping. Um, and it's accepted that um, uh, ministries don't want to hear from one country after another, after another, after another on exactly the same issue. And we've been working as a, a, as a collective. Um, then there has been the, the other channel that we have been using. Britcham is a permanent board member, uh, having been a founding member of Eurocham. Uh, Eurocham for a number of years has been specifically uh, funded uh, by the EU to have a number of working groups to, to guide on, on advocacy issues. And our members through our executive office team or directly have been participating in those working groups. And uh, Eurocham uh, with our support and collaboration has been uh, the vehicle there. Um, and, and really a lot of the discussion that has led to where we are now has come about um, partly to do with Brexit. Um, the, uh, the issues that Europe Cham will deal with predominantly, although they are not established uh, to be uh, only representing the political union, they naturally tend that way. Um, and uh, it's recognized that although we're going to stay very, very close, we have uh, uh, our own um, uh, honorary secretary is the board member of, of Euro Cham as well. Um, there will be issues that are unique to the UK, positions that we wish to take that are unique to the U UK, impacts from uh, Indonesian government policy that will perhaps impact our members in a slightly different way to uh, other country nationals that are invested. Um, and uh, we want to be in a position to have the networks, the resources, the capability available to take on um, those issues. So we will continue, Ian, uh, to, uh, to, to work with other foreign chambers where that is the appropriate way. We will continue to work with uh, Eurocham as a channel as well, where it's uh, a collective uh, uh, example. Um, but we also want to have this capability. The, the key, though, is communication from members. Um, and uh, subsequent to this, uh, on, on my to-do list and, and my team, is to reach out again to our members and to begin to map out what really are the issues that you are facing, um, as Ollie said, to then present them through our committee, um, Pat Dendi, Pat Harun, Donny, others, um, <clears throat> and realistically work out, uh, I'll use Ollie's expression, you know, what, what we can uh, nudge the needle on, I think was the expression, was it Ollie? Um, um, and we will do that through this collaboration, this partnership uh, with Karoyan Partners. Um, so it, it's, a question of, it, it's a question of getting that feedback back. Um, it, it's, it's you, our members, articulating uh, what actually are the impediments? What are the challenges? What are the uh, what 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 would look like a successful lobby or a slight compromise in the right direction? Um, and and we'll take it up. And and, and I hope that's hel a helpful response to your to your question about how do we go forward. That's a great response. Thanks for that. I, I think I speak for many on the call this afternoon who who'd welcome the opportunity to come in now that uh, we have such a professional array of resources uh, ready to uh, to support this. So yeah, happy to be part of it and happy to be back in Indonesia. So thanks for that, Chris. Oli, as well, thanks. Well, if I may comment, one thing that doesn't work in Indonesia is megaphone policy. So Indonesia thinks that we will be done quietly. 
and you don't create an uproar. And that will be very counterproductive. I still remember, I think it was in 99, embassies of um, countries that are the base of many mining companies. It, what I think the diplomatic term is a demarch on the Indonesian government because of the changes. And I was asked to participate. At the time, I was country head of a British-based mining company, a large one. And I said, no, it won't work. And I didn't want to be associated with that. And it fell flat, as I expected. Because that's not the way to do things in Indonesia. Doesn't mean Thank that you we don't strategize, but we have to do the right strategy. And of course, current partners will be very happy to, to contribute to that. But the general direction, of course, we will have to defer to you because you're running the show. Thank you, Va. Um, that's Thank you. Uh, the, the uh, good question from Ian's, and I think um, we we have to to all of us at the at that at Bridgem will uh, will uh, definitely want to uh, move things forward and and uh, make the uh, committee useful for for the members. Uh, next question from uh, Wilson Andrew, uh, please will. Wilson, time is yours. Yep. Uh, thank you and hi everyone. <clears throat> hello. It's hello Panoka. Uh, no, but... <laughs> it's good to see uh, many familiar faces as well, and hopefully we are uh, safe in this challenging time. So, uh, uh, yeah, Panoka, I just have some uh, questions. So basically, uh, as you know, my company Shipper, uh, we are in the digital logistics space, right? And we feel that uh, the logistics landscape and overall will be quite different in the in the coming years because uh, government are really uh, pushing a lot of infrastructure development for example uh, but of course we, uh, we, we we cannot see the benefits yet in the in the sh short run right so uh, we see that there will be a lot of opportunities ahead right especially with the growing e-commerce because like uh, with this uh, pandemic everyone is staying at home they're buying stuff from uh, from the, the the house and of course you will need the logistics to uh, deliver the package right but uh, we also see that there will be a lot of challenges as well because again uh, how uh, with this uh, infrastructure development uh, all the business business players and maybe a potential investor from uh, British uh, can can take part in this uh, big uh, and I, I can say that giant uh, cake for the logistics so uh, just uh, just in that context, uh, I'd like to know how do you see uh, the policies uh, going ahead by the government? Uh, because uh, you also know that there are different parts of the ministries that working uh, kind of silo, if I can say, like you have Cominfo in the postal and career, and then Ministry of Transportation, and then you have Ministry of UPR for the for the road construction, for example. Yeah. So th thank you so much, uh, Panoke. Well, thank you. So I think uh, you're actually in a good spot because you're doing things on a digital platform. I think the president himself is very much in uh, everything digital. And that's why he has um, appointed Nadi Makarim as Minister of Education because he believes that this is the future of Indonesia. So you're in um, an area that is favored by the government or particularly by the Jacobi administration these days. That there are so many silos that uh, I think uh, also result of the political compromise that he has to make to get everybody, um, all parties support him. And as you can see, most of the problems are caused by, not by the ministers who come from professional background, from ministers who represent political parties, decide, because they have different interests and they have to promote their political parties too. So in that respect, I think the Cominfo ministry, the Ministry of uh, 
uh, communications and information play a role too. But your industry is not yet regulated and that not to, not to a large extent. The amount of regulations that touch your business is still, I would say, uh, not that many compared to more established industries. So that is your, I would say your opportunity. And despite the fact that you're competing against others, everybody's in the same boat, so it would be advisable to join forces with others to promote the same. Because individual companies, you won't get them. But you have like-minded people with you and also business associations, because there are a number that you can join, the more the merrier. And that's where you can get some traction too. Because as I said earlier, as an individual company, you don't think probably some people will listen to you, but you won't get very far. Thank you, Bert. Thank you, Farah. Okay, I think that's uh, very insightful. Um, any any other question? We have six minutes left before we close the session. Uh, may I ask if um, Oli, Pa, uh, Dendi, or Chris, uh, if you have any question to Pa Noke? Yes, if I uh, if I may, um, Pat Harun. Um, yes, please. Pat, Pat Nocker, you you obviously um, have a uh, an array of uh, international clients. Um, you you will be aware of uh, the range of issues that tend to um, affect international businesses that are invested in Indonesia in particular, and and those businesses that are looking to perhaps trade with the country. Um, what would you say, um, you know, if, if, if the if international communities are looking for a little bit of lower hanging fruit were compromised through soft diplomacy, as you as you suggested is the way uh, were were adopted, um, could actually be taken on to positive effect. What, what might you suggest um, are the issues that fall into the, that category? Well, I think every industry is different. So, what what you consider a compromise may be different. We uh, see differently among industries, but it's important that uh, I think you you don't mean compromise in compromise with ethics, because I would strongly advise against that. Because once you do that, then you are lost forever. And as I said, things can be done in Indonesia without resorting to that. And it will take longer, but uh, ultimately I think when you persevere, you will prevail if you do the right thing. To compromise is a must in business and in politics, but without compromising your family. I think that's the most important thing. Thank you, Pat. And, and in terms of the issues that you think are the issues that the international communities can perhaps shift government uh, position, what, what might well, they be at the moment? I think one is this uh, capital requirement. If can be explained to the government with clear examples from different countries. Actually, having a lot of smaller investments is as good as having a big one. And if that big one ever comes, it will be even better to have a lot of smaller investments. And I think there are interest in that. There are companies that may be willing to spend 
1 billion rupiah on, on capital, but not 10 billion, or maybe half a billion. And still, you have to look at the future. If it's an industry that is expanding, then in the future, there will be more money coming in because of the need to expand. The government always looks at the starting point and says, oh, this is small. $500,000, who wants to But forgetting that that's a start and that once you're getting bigger, you'll be expanding, you will be needing more and more, and you will be uh, getting more traction. And one thing that I don't agree with many government officials is the, and you often hear that, you don't want to be just a market. Look, a market has power. Well, China is powerful because it's a big market. So is India. And we are always saying we don't want to be just a market you have to produce here. Well, what's the good of producing if you don't sell it? So I think this is a, it's a totally wrong perspective. And it reminds me of when I was running business selling group in Germany. And one of the companies was in the former German Democratic Republic. And the chief engineer came to me and said, you can make this and that. I said, just show me how big the market size is. You can convince me that we can, we can, we can sell the product that you are telling me about right now, then we can do it. But without telling me what the market size is, just don't talk to me about it. I'm sure you can do everything. But the important thing is the market. And I think that's one thing that I think we need to advocate. And that market has power. If you don't have the market, you don't have the power. If Indonesia is a large market, you can dictate. You do that here, and people will follow you. But this is another fallacy in government policy that we think <clears throat> collectively, maybe the foreign business community can do something about and also point out that market is important actually because we are too much emphasizing on production. We must produce here. But if you have a big enough market, then you don't have to tell anyone he will come to produce here, we have the market. So I think these are two items that we, I think we need to advocate also by having meetings, discussions, and also selling the point that this must be done to, to uh, improve the Indonesian economy. Market is not bad. Market is actually the start of production. You can, you can sell, you do this. Thank you, Pat Nocker. Um, Pat Harun, I noticed a couple of final hands up, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, we have, uh, I think, uh, two uh, last questions before we wrap up. Uh, Chris, Pat Nocker, um, uh, from Pak Joko Widayatno and Pak Zul oh. Henry Abdullah. So let uh, us uh, start with the question from Pak Joko. Uh, Pajoko, time is yours. Joko from Indonesian Mining Association. Ah, there you are. <laughs> yes, sir. My good friend. Good evening, Pak Niko. Hello, Guten Abend. how are you? Good Abend. <laughs> Long time. I studied in Germany, so that's why. Wrong <laughs> so, place to say Guten Abend, though. Yeah. Uh, I still in Jogja, Pak Niko, because PPK. And, but I want to have some explanation from your side. The investment in uh, mineral and coal still low now. What is the strategy to increase that? Because we need new investment for the exploration and junior company never come. So Indonesia is, a, I can say that Indonesia is a beautiful girl, but nobody have to a courage to get married with them. Because it's yes, too many because problems. it demands too much. Yes. 
So, what is your suggestion that to increase the... Well, I think you know the answer. If you require foreign mining companies to divest more than 50% of their shares, who's interested? Yeah. And you know also that in the beginning, when uh, Pak Bambang was the director general, he agreed yeah. to have it 20%. That foreign companies have to divest 20%. That was our agreement at the time. And I, I think with 20%, people will come, but not with 51%. Mm -hmm. So whatever the government does to, to attract mining companies, foreign mining companies, if you require them to divest <clears throat> after you start production, well, you just start earning yeah, money yeah. and then you have to divest. That's, that's, I don't think that's logical. Yeah. But you know the answer too. I think you're just testing me, Joker. Yes. <laughs> you know it very well. Nobody will yeah. come as long as this requirement is there. Thank you, Pak Nico. Thank you, Pak Nico. So, last question will be from Pak Suhendri. Uh, please, Pak Suhendri. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Pa Harun. Uh, good, af good afternoon, good evening, maybe, Pa Noke. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Pa. Just short uh, question, Pa. I just would like to hear your view on the recent government initiatives on the talk to implement this, what we call as a multi tariff VAT scheme, Pa, uh, where in theory, at least, they'd say that. Uh, for the luxurious goods or services, they will uh, apply this uh, higher rate than the current rate. And the basic needs, they will uh, apply the uh, much uh, lower. But uh, in practice, what we see uh, rather looks like a contradiction, but, uh, meaning that uh, even for a basic service like a medical service and insurance service for protection, this is also being wiped out right now from the uh, VAT list. Uh, so how do you read all this contradiction between theory and in practice, Pak Noke? Thank you, Pak. Well, even a single tariff is difficult to implement, let alone a multi-tariff system. I think it's not workable because it will be um, tax office will be overworked by this, and I think there's a lot of unpredictable too. And one thing is that the it's not really a VAT issue because it's tax upon tax. It's, in rare occasions, can you offset your uh, income, your incoming sales tax when you are not doing that. So I think this will be a disincentive to expanding the economy. That's my personal view. So it's something that will not be welcomed by the uh, business community, also the Indonesian one. It's not only Britain, but also Indonesian companies will be affected and if Indonesian companies are affected, then it's, there's a better chance that uh, you can get through with having that modified to a system that is acceptable to everyone. Thank you, Panoka. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Panoka. Thank you, Pa Rohendri. Um, I think. Um, we uh, are at the end of, of, of the session. So uh, thank you very much again, Pa Noka, for all the uh, insights, um, your wisdom and, and, and sharing the experience. Um, this is a very good start for uh, Bridge Jam Advocacy Committee. Uh, this is uh, just the beginning. Uh, so, um, we uh, should continue the discussion and thinking about the uh, the next step uh, and 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 uh, make some uh, impacts and 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 assist the uh, 
the members. Uh, now I think uh, I'll, it's uh, I will I will give the uh, uh, session to back to uh, Chris. Over to you, Chris. Um, that, thank you very much. And before I uh, the final words to uh, to Ollie. Uh, yes, again, thank you, uh, Pat no Pat Nocker. Uh, it's been uh, a pleasure and seamless working with your team to get this uh, first plenary event underway. And we we look forward to the remaining months of this year working very closely with you and them. Um, just to let everybody know at um, advocacy of a slight difference, maybe. Um, tomorrow, uh, Britcham is uh, leading on a joint foreign chambers event, uh, <clears throat> which really is trying to offer uh, foreign private sector support for the Olympic. Indonesian bid for the 2032 Olympics. Uh, I think not a lot of people know that Indonesia is actually formally put a bid in, one of only two countries. Um, it's reasonably accepted that the Brisbane bid is in the lead, um, but uh, Indonesia does uh, does actually have an awful lot to offer in the in the context of what are now the uh, uh, the the parameters that the Olympic Committee tend to look at, and uh, I think from a private sector point of view, there is a sense that uh, there could be some very very positive impacts for business, international relations, and more. Uh, if the bid is successful, and even if it's not successful, let's not forget that London had to lose a couple of times to be able to get a successful bid. Um, so, so what we're actually trying to do here is this is the beginning of Britcham uh, trying to um, lead a coalition of the foreign chambers, uh, a few of them partnering with us um, tomorrow, and we, we will build that support where we, we're hoping to offer um, a statement of endorsement from the foreign business community of the Indonesia bid to the national uh, to the, um, uh, the the Olympic Committee, the Global Olympic Committee. And tomorrow is an opportunity to learn an awful lot more about the bid, the plans for the legacy, the infrastructure that's already there and can be used on the back of the Asian Games um, <clears throat> success. Uh, so do please join us for that if you're able to. And have time. It's 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 our way of soft advocacy, Pat Docker. Um, okay, Ollie. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Just very briefly, and, and a, a thank you also to Pat Harun and, and Pat Nocker. That was that was very insightful. Um, look, as I said earlier, one of the the core objectives of myself and the board is, is to continue to enhance our membership proposition, uh, and this is one of the key key ways of doing that. I, I hope so. Uh, I do encourage you. Please reach out. Um, Chris is probably your, your best point of contact with with any queries that you'd like to raise, um, and then him himself and Pat Dendy will take it to the committee and and start discussions from there. But we, we do rely on you know advice from from the members. Otherwise, uh, this can get quite dry quite quickly. So um, I, I'm also keen to learn the art of soft diplomacy from Pat Knocker as well. So I should be talking to him separately. But um, with that, look, thank you everybody, and, and hopefully plenty more of this type of initiative to come and, and as I said earlier some tangible results would be nice as well so um, uh, fingers crossed for that and, and I wish you all a, a safe and pleasant evening. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.